OK. So what I thought I'd do is I'd just start by giving an introduction, basically, to sort of Hamiltonian systems and how it relates to symplectic geometry. And then I'll talk about periodic orbits and this, these methods for finding them. So we have two coordinates. So one is position, which we usually write as q. And the other one is momentum. And then if I'm given position and momentum, I can um, tell you what the energy of my system is at that point. So it's some, oh, it's usually q, q. It's some energy at the, this value, which is some function of p, q, and time. So the energy might change over time. And uh, so this is the Hamiltonian. So an example, which will be used throughout this talk, is just a very simple, the simplest non-trivial example I can think of is you have some sort of U-shaped wire like this. And then you have some sort of bead on this wire. And it's frictionless, and the bead stays on this wire, and it's just completely frictionless. So um, and then the Q coordinate would be something like the horizontal displacement from the center. And maybe the P coordinate would be, say, the horizontal component of momentum or something like that. And a Hamiltonian would look something like sort of up to rescaling the coordinates or something like that would be something like this, of q squared plus p squared. So this would be the q part would represent potential energy, and the p part uh, would represent kinetic energy. So given p, q, and h, one, you can write down Hamilton's equations. So we have Hamilton's equations, which are you have derivatives of h on the left-hand side, and it's equal to some matrix times time derivatives on the right-hand side, something like that. So another way of writing these equations, which is the way I prefer writing it, is as follows. So let's, so another way of sort of you thinking about these equations is the following. So if I write this matrix, I'll call it omega, like this. Then I write these equations as dh by dq, dh by dp equals omega times xh. So xh is a vector field. And, um, and the point is that the, the, the sort of system is the flow of this vector field. So let's, let's, give, let's look at this example here. So we have our coordinate q and our coordinate p. This is an R2. And but let's look at our Hamiltonian. So the level sets of this Hamiltonian are just circles, just getting bigger and bigger, like this. And then the vector field xh is just um, the solution to this equation here. So all that turns out to be is you take the gradient of h, and then you rotate it to the left by 90 degrees in this case. So um, the Hamiltonian vector field uh, looks like this. It's 
So it rotates around, and it stays tangent to the level sets of the Hamiltonian. And it rotates uniformly, so if I, this whole plane rotates uniformly. So if I have, so, so the, the motion of the system is also measured by the flow of this vector field. So if I have a, a bead up here, it has some high position here, and then it, this li line follows this vector field around here, like this. So this is the motion of this system. Okay. So one can look at the, you can look at the um, symmetries of this system. So we could see what happens if we change coordinates. So let's look at what happens when I change coordinates from Q, if I guess a new coordinate system, um, Q1, P1, let's say. So Q1 is a function of PQ. And this is a function of PQ. And you can write a matrix D. Or this is just the matrix of derivatives. Um, like this. And then you can see what happens by how these equations change under the chain rule. So we have a new equations, dh by dq1, dh by dp1 is equal to the transpose of d times omega times d times dq1 by dt times dp1 by dt. So we have new equations in these new coordinates. And the point is, this is a symplectic change of coordinates if, so, so this, co um, this change of coordinates, let me write this here, this change of coordinates, symplectic if d transpose omega d is equal to omega. So if this is equal to omega, so the structure of the equation is preserved under this change of coordinates. Okay. So we can also generalize this to many coordinates. We could have had p1 to pn and q1 to qn, and we could have had omega as before, but now it's the identity matrix 0 minus the identity 0. It's a 2n by 2n matrix in this block form. And the same story just happens. So, so it, in symplectic geometry, we study symplectic manifolds. So what's a symplectic manifold? So it's sort of st studying these sort of systems of equations up to these kinds of change of coordinates. So what's a symplectic manifold? So. So when you define a manifold, you have atlases and charts and so on. So you can do the same thing here. So we have, we, we have, a, we have an atlas. So it's some, some topological space. And it's, it's sort of locally. So we, ha we have a chart. We have charts, just like a charts of a manifold. And these are open subsets of R2n. And um, we have transition maps, just as in the definition of a manifold. So these open subsets come with coordinates, sort of Q1, Q1 to Qn, P1 to Pn. And then the transition maps are symplectic changes of coordinates. So it's just in the same way as manifold definition, but sort of we, we, we replace chart changes from smooth maps to symplectic maps. Um, so that's a symplectic manifold. Okay. So 
what kind of questions do symplectic geometers sort of ask in general? So we could ask things like the following. So one question which is related to the title is, when does a Hamiltonian have periodic orbits? So what's a periodic orbit? Well, it's a map gamma from r over l times z, where l is called the period of the orbit, to our symplectic manifold m. And so it satisfies d gamma phi dt equals xh. So it's a flow line of this vector field, this Hamiltonian vector field. It's a flow line of this Hamiltonian. And um, so L is the period. So this is a periodic orbit. So um, in this picture here, we, we have a periodic orbit of period 2 pi. You start here, and you flow around, and you get back to your started, where you started after time 2 pi. And then you can ask other things like how many... How many of them are there? Uh, where are they? Can we find them? Things like this. So another sort of goal in symplectic geometry is to sort of, well, you have all these symplectic manifolds, so we could study them up to sort of symplectomorphism, just as like people who study manifolds study them up to diffeomorphism. So study symplectic manifolds. Study symplectic manifolds up to symplectomorphisms, so up to diffeomorphisms, pervert preserving these chart changing maps and so on. And then there's other questions. Can we symplectically embed some manifolds? into others? Are there obstructions? And then there's also links to other areas as well, which I won't discuss at all, so add links to other areas. There's lots of questions related to that in, say, low-dimensional topology. Um, dynamical systems. I suppose algebraic geometry. This is not an exhausted list, but I'm listing broad subjects anyway. So, geometry is physics as well, and so on. Ah, okay. Okay, so these are the sort of general goals, some of the general goals of this subject area. And there's probably other, I mean, there's other things as well. Okay. So, in this talk, I'm going to look at these two areas here, and I'll mainly focus on this periodic orbits area here. So, So I'm going to look at a tool called symplectic cohomology.
And in this talk, I don't really have time to define this properly, but I'll state it why, why it's, how it's defined and, um, and so on. So, so a lot of the people who sort of drove this definition, I suppose, were people like, so there's Chili Back, um, so people wrote earlier papers on this, Fleur, a lot, lot of it's driven by Fleur, so Fleur. Wisoski. And Viterbo. So, if I have a Hamiltonian H, so it's an, a Hamiltonian, so we think of this as, um, we think of this as a map so it, from, say, M to R, but it's allowed time dependence, but, it's sort of peri but maybe only periodic time dependence, so we could, um, so it's a time variable. And so one should really think about um, generally, we're going to work with R to the two n. So we're going to look at our, we're going to generally look at this case here. But this is um, we're going to, um, but it works for general symplectic manifolds, and this will be used on later on as well. Okay, and so from this Hamiltonian, in nice circumstances. You can associate a group to this Hamiltonian called Fleur homology, Fleur cohomology. Uh, I'm going to put a little minus there, just as that's just a notational thing. So, in nice circumstances, we have this Fleur cohomology group here. And what? So, okay. So here's one of the properties of this Fleur cohomology group. So. It's it has a chain, so the first thing is, it's the homology of a chain complex. And this chain complex is generated by the one periodic orbits of this Hamiltonian. So, so the chain complex. So only orbits of period one. So if we looked at um, this example here, like this, then there's only one one periodic orbit, and that corresponds to the constant one at the center. There's other orbits here, but these have the wrong period. They have period 2 pi or something like this. So that's the wrong period. So there's only one in this case. But if I rescaled this Hamiltonian, then suddenly there would be loads if I rescaled it appropriately. If I multiplied it by some constants, I don't know, 2 pi or something like that, then there would be infinitely many, and the whole, every point would be started a periodic orbit, and there'd be lots of them. Okay. Um, and then there's a technical condition, so this is actually just general. I'm only going to look at the case where it's generated by some periodic orbits, um, and it's just some. Some means that some integral is negative, so some technical integral is negative. So if I have periodic orbit gamma of t, and let's suppose we're in R2n, so it's p of t, comma q of t like this, then it's sort of some integral is negative. But 
this is just a technical thing, so orbit satisfying this integral. And then there's a differential, and this is takes too long. This this would take be too involved to define, and it wouldn't to properly motivate it would, would take a long time, but it involves solutions of a solutions of the following equations called the perturbed cauchy riemann equation. And J is some matrix and, and so on. And so there's some very beautiful ideas related to this definition, which um, I don't really have time to explain in this talk at the moment. So, so but we're, I would say, for practical purposes, you rarely, if ever, explicitly solve these equations. Generally, you infer that there are solutions from some sort of general principles. There's another property, it's the second property. If I have, if I have two Hamiltonians, I have a natural map, and there exists a natural map. This is, these are the sort of two properties, main properties I would use of this um, homology group. Okay. So what is symplectic cohomology then? So I have my symplectic manifold M. And it satisfies some additional conditions, but um, I'm not going to say much about that. So instead, uh, we should just think of M as our R2N or something like this. It satisfies some additional conditions. Generally, it's a non-compact manifold, and it has something called a cylindrical end, but um, this, is just, this is too involved for the moment. So and I take a compact subset of M. So, okay, there's a compact subset. And then I choose a sequence of Hamiltonians. So I choose a sequence of Hamiltonians. And they're all less than equal to each other, so there's some ordered sequence of Hamiltonians. And they get bigger and bigger. And they satisfy some properties. So there's three properties. So one is Hi restricted to K, the compact set, is less than or equal to zero. So I'll draw a picture in a minute to explain, the, to sort of show you how to visualize these properties. So B. Hi of x tends to infinity for all x not in this compact subset. And three C Hi is constant at infinity. 
So those are the three properties. So let me give you an example of this when M is just R2 and K is just the unit disk. This is an example I'm going to just keep going back to. So example, M is R2, K is unit disk. So I'll just draw these Hamiltonians in this case. So I'm going to just draw a sideways view of this. I can, so M is just going to be a line. Um, this is going to be the radial coordinate. And then K is going to be, let me draw this another color. K is going to be this blue set here. And then the Hamiltonians, I'm just going to draw the graphs of these Hamiltonians. So these Hamiltonians are going to look like this. And they're going to go down. And they're going to go sort of down under here. And then like this. These are graphs of the Hamiltonian. say it's of height i or something like that. So the top-down view, if I look to the top-down view of this, top view. then I'd have R2 as the blackboard, and uh, the K is in blue, so I'm going to draw this in blue. That's not blue. K is now this blue thing here. And then you can look at the, um, say, the Hamiltonian vector field. So this Hamiltonian is very small here, so the vector field is almost zero here. And then it suddenly slopes up, so it suddenly goes up, and the vector field sort of near the edge here is quite small, like this. And then it gets much bigger, very fast. And then it gets smaller again as the slope of this Hamiltonian gets smaller again. And then it's zero, so it's constant here and constant here. So that's what the Hamiltonians look like. And then from these Hamiltonians, we define our symplectic cohomology group. Zero. Uh, yeah, I mean zero, sorry. Zero. Zero. So that's the vector field, but the Hamiltonian is constant. Yeah. So we define SH star of m comma k to be just the direct limit of Fleur cohomology of HA. So this definition is, the only important thing about this definition to know is that somehow the generators of this cohomology group are the orbits of HA. And um, computing this explicitly is impossible. Well, almost impossible. I, for ellipses, yeah. I mean, but you, usually computing it, you do something like you show there's no differentials. You don't usually solve the equations directly. I mean, sometimes you do, maybe. I don't know if you've for done polydisks, it. You have to. For polydisks, you have to. So some people do it, but um, most people don't. Uh, but maybe we should, but it's quite hard. So. Okay.
OK, but then we do have a theorem which helps us compute this. And I'm not sure who this theorem is by, but there's some ideas by. I think, actually, I think Chile back and Wansha are writing something. Um, but I think there's ideas due to other people as well, like maybe Victor Ginsburg and so on. But um, I'll just put lots of question marks here because um, I'm not quite sure who to reference here. So if there exists a Hamiltonian whose flow displaces K, then symplectic cohomology of MK is zero. And you can also, um, yeah, you can, there's, there's also sort of, you can actually tell when sort of, um, anyway, anyway this, this is a sort of theorem. Okay, so let's look at this example again. So let's look at the Hamiltonian given by P, the coordinate P. So P is the height here. So P is, um, if I write the axes, P is the height here. And remember the Hamiltonian flow is the gradient of, say, P, gradient of our Hamiltonian rotated to the left by 90 degrees in this two-dimensional case. So the flow of P is given by a vector field which uniformly just travels to the left. So if I look at this compact set K and I see what it happens when I flow under this vector field, what happens is it uniformly flows to the left. And eventually, it will be displaced off itself. And so symplectic cohomology of this set K is going to be 0. I'll write this down. Okay, so you might think, well, that's a bit bad because, well, we want to find periodic orbits. And the good thing about this homology group is, well, well it, it's generated by periodic orbits. And, um, and so you would think, well, you would want a non-zero homology group so you could show that there exists periodic orbits in the first place. So I'll explain how to find periodic orbits using this result. Um, So as an application. So we'll have a Hamiltonian. And this time it's in R2n. And it's any Hamiltonian with the inverse image of some constant c uh, compact. some c. Then there are periodic orbits There are periodic orbits arbitrarily close to h to the minus 1 of c, but not exactly. It won't sit on h to the minus 1 c. There exists level sets where there are no periodic orbits, but arbitrarily close, there exist periodic orbits. 
So this is the theorem I was going application I was going to show you. So okay. And I'm going to prove it by an example, and I'm going to prove it by an example which is basically very similar to this. So um, So proof by example. So the Hamiltonian I'm going to look at is this Hamiltonian I've been writing down several times now. This one here. And the level set I'm going to look at is, which is minus 1, 1. So we know where all the periodic orbits are here, but let's pretend we don't. So I'll write this down. So let's pretend we don't know that H has. So, oh, yeah. Periodic orbit means periodic orbit of any periods. The, the, the periods get very, very long when you go near h to the minus 1 c. So get extremely long. Yes, but yes. Uh, no. I mean, this one doesn't have integer. I mean. So, so it, it could be some irrational thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's draw this picture again. And you have a unit circle. So this is now h to the minus 1 of 1. Oh, no, it's a circle of radius of 1 over root 2. So, or root 2, uh, something like that. Some circle. OK. And we're going to look at the following. So this is going to be, I'm going to draw this in blue. And this is going to be my compact set K from which I'm going to compute symplectic cohomology. So let's do a side view of this. So side view. So this, again, is this sort of graph picture I'm going to draw. So this is going to be the radial coordinate. It's going to be k. My Hamiltonian looks like, this is the graph of my Hamiltonian, it's the parabola, it's a graph of H. And then I'm going to look at the following functions. So this point's going to be H to the minus 1 of 1. It's a function from R to R. And the graph looks something like uh, this. So it's sort of very small here, and then it gets very high, and then it gets constant like this. It has I height, say, i, or something like this. So it gets higher and higher as i increases. And then we look at the following Hamiltonian. Uh, 
Um, I must write it like this. So we define HI as the composition of FI with H. So what does composing FI with H do? Well, so FI is a function from the reals to the reals. So if you look at, say, one of the derivatives of H, like, say, dH by dQ, dHi by dQ, well, that's, that's just Fi prime times dH by dQ. So all, it, all that happens is uh, the, the, the Hamiltonian flow is rescaled uniformly by the derivative of Fi. So let's look at what H, the graph of HI looks like as well. And then I'll draw the Hamiltonian flows of HI, which look very similar to this picture here, actually. So the graph of HI is a graph of And then the Hamiltonian vector field of HI. So is exactly the same sort of description as the one over here. So we have it's small near K, and then it gets extremely big slightly further away from k, and then it gets smaller again, like this. But the point is, yeah, so the key point, the key point one periodic orbit. So the non-trivial one-periodic orbits of HI are rescaled orbits of any arbitrary large period of H. And the other advantage is these Hamiltonians HI are the ones that define synthetic cohomology. So we can look at... So we can run the following argument. So so, so the periodic orbits, so this is the flow, so this is the flow of HI. And then we have constant periodic orbits here. So we know what these orbits are. And we have constant orbits here. And then I said, let's pretend we don't know what the orbits of H here. So these are unknown orbits. But all we know about these unknown orbits is that they're rescaled orbits of H. So it turns out that so symplectic so Fleur homology, the chain complex for Fleur homology does not count these orbits here. So that's just a fact. So the chain complex. So we know that. Yes. So symplectic homology of um, R2n, comma, this blue set, let's write blue set, oops. So we know that's zero because um, by this argument here. And we know that the chain complex is generated by some constant orbits 
inside k plus orbits we don't know. And the point is the point is that if there were no orbits near, then 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 it turns out the constant orbits would give you non-trivial symplectic cohomology. <coughs> So why is that, which would give a contradiction? So there have to be orbits. So the point is this. So actually, with this Hamiltonian, we can do something slightly better. We can make the bottom of this Hamiltonian. Uh, I haven't got the red thing, but we can make the bottom of this Hamiltonian sort of sag a little bit like this. And then instead of having lots of constant periodic orbits, we just have one here. And you can't have a vanishing chain complex with one orbit. So, um, so it must be killed by something non-trivial. So the, the, the key point is we have some orbits that we know and some orbits that we don't know. And we want to find out something about the orbits that we don't know. And so, but they must, be, they must kill the orbits that we do know. And so those, or, those orbits that we don't know must exist. So that's the sort of key point. Um, OK. Near. Uh, Sorry, as near as, as near as I wish. So, the sort of nearness is, yeah. Ne like, uh, you just have to choose how, how high this steep this slope is, and you can make it as near as you wish by making the slope as steep as you like. So, okay. OK, I wanted to do another application of symplectic homology. Um, and this is going to have less details. So I um, just wanted to demonstrate that it has another completely different use other than finding periodic orbits. So it has other applications as well. So like, um, when do certain compact sets K embed into other compact sets um, and so on? But I'm not going to talk about that. So I wanted to talk about a bit of, so I wanted to talk about exotic symplectic manifolds. So one's ones, so these are manifolds, these are diffeomorphic but it, it's more than that, um, they're going to be, they're going to be more than, than, than that because for instance, if I took like the unit disk in C2, that has volume one, uh, volume two, no, volume pi. pi. So that has volume pi. And but C C2 has, I mean, but but R2 has vo infinite volume. So that I mean, so I could say this is exotic. Um, by just by volume reasons, but that's that's sort of silly. That's a trip. That's a, that's exotic symplectic manifolds for silly reasons. So so I'll say, uh, I without using volume. So they'll have all have infinite volume. Let's say. Uh, yeah, and nice. There you go. That's sufficiently vague for anyone to like <laughs> criticize me. OK. So the ones I was going to look at just come from algebraic geometry. So um, these are actually going to be, so it's going, we're going to look at 
affine variety. So we have A, which is a smooth affine. The best thing to do is write down the example, and then you have to appreciate it as being nice. So uh, variety. So this is a, so this is o over C. So for instance, I don't know, z1 squared plus z2 squared equals 1, c2 or something like this. And this has a natural symplectic structure. So there's a natural symplectic structure. So we view A as a subset of CM, let's say. So we just take the standard symplectic structure on CN and we restrict it to A. And this gives A, this makes A into a symplectic manifold and it has infinite volume. And the symplectic structure, if I have two affine varieties and let's say they're biholomorphic to each other, then they're actually symplectomorphic to each other. So the symplectic form is a biholomorphic invariant and so on. So, so it, it's a very strong invariant. It's much stronger than biholomorphism, actually. Far stronger. OK. So we need to find, I want to find an affine variety which is exotic, which means it's diffeomorphic but not symplectomorphic. So I'm going to use symplectic cohomology. So how do I do that? So, well, I need an, I mean, symplectic cohomology was, is at the moment, was an invariant of a pair, manifold and compact subset. But I want it an invariant of the whole manifold. So what I do is I define SH star A to be SH star A comma very large ball, very large closed ball intercept A. This is in CN. And this is a symplectic invariant. So I won't explain why that is, but it is. Um. And so let's look at CN. So symplectic cohomology of CN is just symplectic cohomology of CN comma large ball. And this large ball is displaceable. So this group vanishes. So all I need to do is find an A. I need to find A with non-zero symplectic cohomology. Um, and again, because symplectic cohomology is so hard to compute, one has to eventually rely on some general theorem to uh, prove um, that it's non-zero. Um, Actually, one can partially compute things. One can actually write down generators and show they're not killed and so on, but um, I won't explain that. Um, so there's a theorem, I think, by Viterbo. If there exists a manifold, it's not a symplectic manifold, it's just some manifold, L. 
a, and the real dimension of L is equal to the complex dimension of A. And, and such that so the symplectic structure vanishes on L. So that means it's what we call a this is called a Lagrange this is what we call a Lagrangian. So and it satisfies another condition, which is um, there exists, that there's that, that does not exist a holomorphic disk D mapping to our affine variety A such that the boundary of D maps to L and D is non constant. So if we have those two conditions, so then So all we need to do is find this Lagrangian such that there's no holomorphic disks on it. So, um, so that's what we need to do. And I don't have time to uh, explain. I don't have time to explain how to find this Lagrangian, but um, I could just write down the equations of this affine variety. Uh, Actually, I think I'll just stop. So, so um, yeah, I, I'll write down the equation of this affine variety. So it's so it's the cross product of this affine variety with itself, and there's an explicit Lagrangian in there, but I don't have time to. Um, tell you that. So, um, so this is the candidate, and I won't say any more about that. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much.